This is a Word Fitly Spoken podcast. By words about reading the scriptures, about preaching the scriptures, and about the mission on which the scripture sends all of us. We here at A Word Fitly Spoken aim to give you, the servant of Christ, more and more always from the fullness the Lord has given us in His Holy Word. I'm Willie Grills, here as always with Zelwyn Heidi, and back with us today is Reverend David Apple. How's it going, guys? It's going great, Willie. It's good to be back with you guys. How's the, uh, how's the weather out in Paducah? Oh man, it was a beautiful spring day today. I think it was 75 or something like that. Sunshine all day long. Beautiful. Zelwyn, have you taken your buffalo hide off yet? Would you believe that it was actually really warm today? We had a <laughs> freak snowstorm here. So, you know. <laughs> it is so what we're it is. warmer than you. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Come to Kentucky and we'll have a we'll we'll record together in person. There we go. Yeah, a live a live cast in person. Three to four mics at a table, you know. Dreaming big, guys. Dream big. All right. So today we're continuing our discussion on the fourfold distinction of man. David, why don't you go ahead and give us a quick uh, summary of that once again? Sure. Let's see where to begin. We're in our third podcast here on this topic, but the basic distinction is this, that the state of man is, man is found in varying states, okay? And there's four basic states, man as he was in Eden, which we don't have any experiential knowledge of, man as he was after the fall, man as he is in faith in Christ, and man as he will be in glory in the resurrection. And this is a distinction that's I think it it got a lot more traction after the Reformation among the more Reformed, you know, Lutherans. It's included in our confessions or in the Solid Declaration, but it's also a really helpful distinction across the board in the Reformed churches. I, I don't know enough to say much about the Roman Catholic Church and if they use this distinction, but it finds its origin back in St. Augustine, and uh, he puts it this way. So uh, he talks about it in terms of powers in a man. And so Adam has in Eden the power to sin and the power not to sin. He has both of these things. After the fall, natural man has only the power to sin, period. So the the saw is completely bent and it always cuts crooked until then the third state comes and that is in conversion. Man is restored. He still has this power to sin, but also now again, he's regained the power not to sin. And then finally, in the end, we will have the power not to be able to sin. All right. And so today we're taking an in-depth look at that third distinction in Christ, power to sin and power not to sin. Now, this is something that is perennially debated in Lutheran in Lutheran circles. And what's the uh, what's the Latin expression that we use to kind of express this um, at least in terms of our of our state now that we have been justified before God. Well, wouldn't that be the the simul? Isn't that what you're looking for? That simul is. That is. Yes, yes. The idea that we are simultaneously both righteous, uh, the eustus, and that we are also simultaneously a peccator or a sinner, so that man as he is prior to glory has a foot in both worlds, so to speak. Right. And that distinction is germane uh, to the discussion. It doesn't quite get into the powers per se, but it does recognize a reality that we have both a sinful nature and a new nature, a pure nature. So our topic today then is going to be, how does the scripture present the new man? Because there is a change in a person when he is regenerated, when God has made him into a new creation through his means. There's no getting around that. So what does that mean then? And the scriptures become very clear on this. And we can get caught up in these debates and we can sort of speak in hushed tones or in platitudes or in idioms or in certain ways, you know, to kind of signal the one camp over here or these group of guys over here. But what we're seeking to do is to merely look at the Bible and see what it says to us about this, see what the apostles had to say, and really ultimately see what the Holy Ghost has to say. It's good to give him the the ground every now and again, isn't it, Willie? It's good to hear from him from time to time. (laughs) And that's not putting any of our dogmaticians down by any means. But let's go back to the fountain source for a minute and just just take a look here. You know, because a few of these guys might have something to say. 
Well, really, it's it's all over in the Bible, and you can't really get around the fact that uh, when the apostles, or when the Holy Ghost, or however you want to put it, uh, talk about the new man, the man that believes in God, the, the one who actually has been regenerated, there is a new creation. There is a distinction to be made. It's not like we're just limping along in the sense of still being in the second state of being holy within the power of sin, but rather that we have been taken out of death and placed into life. And as weak and as uh, halting as that might be at times, and as much as we may struggle, we have to recognize that, yes, there is a new believing man in the one whom God has regenerated. Yeah. And, and I think it's also true, too, that most of our listeners, and this is true in my own personal life as well, that this third state where you have both the power to sin and the power not to sin, this is actually the condition that we find ourselves in most often, right? And for most of our lives. The Christian, the Christian finds himself. Right. Of course. And so like, like I was saying before, we don't know exactly, it's been revealed to us in the scriptures what it was like for Adam in Eden, but we, we can't say, oh yeah, it was like this, because we don't have any experiential knowledge of that. We all know uh, what it is to be both fallen and restored. We know what it is to be this in this simul condition. And that's what we spend the majority of our lives in. So my point in saying all of this is just to say this third condition is actually of immense practical importance because this is what we spend most of our lives in. Right, right. Very good. So to really dive in, we have to start with the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fountain source of every blessing. We can't rightly understand righteousness, this new image, or the restoration of the image of God without discussing the mission of Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished. Yeah, so I suppose you could begin by talking about if we are taking on the image of Christ in that sense, uh, what does that image look like? What does Christ's image look like? Yeah, and how do we know? You know, how do we know anything about that image? Well, I was just going to say, in case someone's listening to this and, and hadn't listened to uh, previous ones, when we talk about image, the reason we're using that is because from the get-go, this was kind of the unique way that the scriptures present man. What is man, What is distinct about Adam and Eve as opposed to the other creatures? It's that they are described as being in the image of God. And then that image is lost in the fall. And in order to restore the image, what's required? A second Adam or a new Adam. We need the true image of God to actually come manifest himself to us so that we might also then be restored in that image. So where would we turn, David? Uh, what kind of passages would you turn towards to talk about the image of Christ? Sure. There's any number, right? Uh, any of them that present, and we'll get into quite a few of them here hopefully today, but any that present Jesus, uh, I like to focus in this second Adam or explicitly just described as image of God. Do you want to just go through a, a list here? How do you guys want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's proof text that. Let's anger everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, let's, let's take a look at it. Well, we could even do better than proof texting, Willie. Really. I could just, I could just read like <laughs> portions of verses, you know, like the, the real way you <laughs> right, should Right, there it. we go. <laughs> here's, here's one, uh, maybe the most explicitly, most clearly. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Paul is talking about unbelievers, and uh, he's contrasting his ministry to the ministry of, what would you say, sophists, or the ministry of people who are practicing underhanded ways. And so he describes them and his own ministry by contrast. In their case, he says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Christ himself, then, is the image of the Father. And that has, of course, important implications for us being the image of Christ in terms of that. How would you put it? Like, what would you say, David? Well, maybe I should keep reading because uh, this is maybe the danger of proof text is you get that, okay, we've got Jesus as the image of God, but is there more that can be said there? So Paul continues on, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what I would want to say here 
at the beginning is this, the revelation of Jesus as the image of God. When we spoke about image of God in Adam, we, we talked under kind of three categories. Adam had the right knowledge of God. He had true righteousness before God, and he was created in true holiness before God. Now, all of those things are lost in the fall. And so when Jesus comes, this verse speaks very clearly about him bringing the image of God that restores the true knowledge of God, right? So he has this, he is essentially himself, the image of God. And that also then leads to the proper function of the image of God, which is to reveal that knowledge to us. Yeah, so that in the restoring the image to us, part of it is so that we come to know the Father like we were, well, I suppose you could say like we were supposed to in the yeah. first place, that knowledge has been restored, that which was originally suppressed in unrighteousness. Another passage, great one here. This is the, I think this is a Christmas epistle, Hebrews 1, and this here you get some very explicit, well, some other ways of speaking about image as an icon, but let me just read it again. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So the superiority of the son, the incarnate son over every other revelation that's come before. Uh, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. But that radiance of the glory, again, that's very similar to the second Corinthians passage, the exact imprint of his nature. And the point is not just that Jesus, yes, he is the image of God, but then he reveals God to us. Which is a necessary thing. Since we have suppressed it in unrighteousness, it must be revealed to us. We must be given a new, a new will that would even be inclined towards this, but we must be given a new nature, a new everything in order to even understand this revelation. So first and foremost, everything begins with God as the prime motivator. And all glory be to God for every part of our salvation or justification and sanctification. But we have to start with that knowledge that everything here is from God by necessity. Yeah, and this this is where the anthropological, you know, this fourfold distinction is, you can see it touches on all kinds of other areas of theology, right? It's going to inform how we talk about justification. It's going to f- inform how we talk about sanctification. It informs our Christology, what we're talking about here, the person and work of Jesus Christ. You can speak very clearly about his person. Who is he? He's the image of the Father. And what's his work? to reveal the Father, the Father's grace and mercy. We began with this discussion of knowledge. Now let's move on to a discussion of righteousness and just what is righteousness and where does it come from? And is it something that we possess? And if so, how? I was just going to say, could you ask them one at a time? (laughs) (laughs) No, it's totally McLaughlin report here. Or McLaughlin group, I mean. Well, I mean, if if we're going to be talking about the righteousness of Christ, we have to talk about the the fact, first of all, that he is himself righteous in, in multiple, I suppose you could say in multiple senses, because he is righteous being uh, God, and, you know, God cannot help but, you know, be his own nature, which is, you know, righteousness and truth and purity. But Christ is also righteous because he, in obedience, he submitted himself to the law on our behalf so that he has an active righteousness, and I guess is the language we probably want to use as well as a passive righteousness. So that act of obedience is, uh, is very important. There's no more clear contrast between the first Adam and the new Adam than in Romans chapter 5, uh, beginning around verse 12. If you guys don't mind, I'm just going to go ahead and read uh, like 12 through 21, and then we'll discuss it. We can break it up too, but go ahead. Sure, I just want to get the whole text out of there and then we'll work. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin... For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Okay, let's stop right there then. I guess we will break it up <laughs> according to the to the will of Zelda. Yes. Okay, very clear right here. Death reigned, the consequence of sin reigned from Adam to Moses, even those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. 
who, Adam, was a type of the one who was to come. So in what way is Christ a t- or is Adam a type of Christ? He's a type in the way that he is the the father of of humanity, right? He is the head of right. the body that comes after him. And so he what is true about Adam is passed on to his children. And so then when that is typical of Jesus who when he comes is the type of the new humanity, right? He is the new Adam who is the we don't typically talk about Jesus as the father because that would confuse that's a trinitarian confusion, right? But he fathers a new a new humanity. Yeah. Sure. All right. But the free verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. If many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. I think what Paul is trying to point out, first of all, is that we can't really make a a full one-to-one correlation between Adam's sin and between Christ's uh, righteousness because I mean, that's when he says it's not the free gift is not like the trespass because all of these things came because of sin. But Christ, after many sins, so to speak, brought this free gift and now there has been forgiveness. So it's a, it's a comparison that works, but we have to recognize in a Hebrew sort of way that Jesus, of course, is still greater. Right. And but, but we also have to recommend the commonality of the fact that you have this representative head. And the the punishment for the one man's sin is truly visited upon all of his progeny, and so in that same way, the justification won by the righteousness won for us by Jesus Christ is then passed on to his you know to the whole world it's It's a very important thing because if we don't have this right understanding of at least uh, some form of representation then we cannot understand something like the atonement, let alone something like Christ's act of obedience. Well, if we don't have a a proper understanding of representation, I don't think we can really talk about being conformed to the image of Christ. Because if we are in the image of Adam, if we're conformed to that image in the second state, you know, uh, by nature, according to sin, now being in this third state, you know, in Christ by faith, Uh, Being conformed to the image of son is because we are being conformed to our head. So there is a sense in which this representation works both ways and and has to do with both states. Okay, let's finish up this, uh, this section here. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right, who wants to unpack that one for us? Well, I'll, I'll take a little bit here and then we'll, we'll pass it back and forth. There's, there's so much in the, this passage, right? This type of Adam and, and then fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But maybe uh, one way to get at what you guys were just talking a minute before, the correlation between the type and the antitype is perhaps hard to, to line up directly because it's so clear what Adam's one sin was, right? His act of disobedience was his act of unrighteousness which leads to the unrighteous condition that that we are in by nature. But what is the one act of righteousness that Jesus has accomplished? Was it, you know, one particular moment in his life, in his ministry? I, I would take this to be, it's more like it's summed up in the moment of the cross, right? Will he accept what the Father has has put before him. But all throughout his life, he is living obediently. That act of righteousness is on display. There's never a moment where he is not actively righteous. 
I suppose the w- another way of asking your question would be, yes, the cross is the moment on which we see the, the fullness of Christ's obedience, but there's certainly so much prior to that that is just as important because, you know, Christ has to be born of the Virgin. He has to submit to becoming in, in true obedience into becoming a man and also living in accordance with the law. And all of that is just as important. This isn't just like, oh, Jesus was just hanging out doing his thing until, you know, he got attacked at the cross. The moment Jesus Christ is incarnate, he is winning the salvation of the world. And, you know, that's what we refer to as his act of obedience, his his act of fulfilling of the law for the sake of sinners. His passive obedience, he submits to sinful men, but he also is passively obedient. Uh, but that's But that's just a reflection, rather, of his passive obedience to the will of the Father. He doesn't call upon the angels to minister to him, for example, and he doesn't he doesn't push away the cup. So, yeah, the pinnacle is is absolutely his death upon the cross. But from the time of the incarnation to the cross, really to this day, Jesus Christ is living in our stead. okay, or or for us, for the sake of our salvation. You know, the bit about the law is uh, maybe not of particular interest to our discussion about the image here and the righteousness, but it is certainly part of what Paul is speaking about in the book of Romans. And so those last two verses, and especially this verse, the law came in, what was the purpose of the law? You know, he's been dealing with that and he'll continue to talk about that in Romans. The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So again, he's contrasting this time of man under the law of Moses, the the children of Adam and the the children of Abraham too would be included in here. Sin is increasing more and more, but now under Jesus Christ, grace has come and eternal life will yeah, will be eternal. <laughs> there we go. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back with more word fitly spoken after this. If you like what you're hearing and want more, visit us at wordfitlyspoken.org. There you'll find our blog with lots of interesting articles, exegesis, sermon prep, and history. www.wordfitlyspoken.org You are listening to A Word Fitly Spoken. Willie Grills, Zelwyn Heidi here with David Appled, talking about Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Very important topic. Jesus Christ makes us righteous, for he, he himself is our righteousness, and he is the image of the invisible one who makes the unholy, which is us, into holy ones. Let's talk about holiness for a little bit, specifically um, as it pertains to Jesus Christ. Sure. Remember, we want to be talking about this because this goes back to the image of God definition that we gave before. So Jesus, as the image of God, manifests the true knowledge of God, the Father. He brings the righteous, he brings God's righteousness to us, and he also then reveals and makes us holy uh, in the way that he is holy. Yeah, very true. So we're going to just dive right in there to Colossians 1 beginning with verse 15. So that's Colossians 1, verse 15. And I think we're all reading, for some reason, from the English Standard Version today. So, he (laughs) is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and for him. All right, let's stop right there. Let's unpack this a little bit. Almost sounds like the creed, guys. It's almost as if the creed is in accordance with the scriptures. Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> now I know where those guys got this. It's worth noting here, uh, this this passage is, I think it's often referred to as perhaps a creedal formula, even before Paul writes it here. So, he may, And, you know, I don't know how you determine where what the origin of these things are who knows whether Paul wrote it or whether it was being used already by the Colossians but in any case 
you're right, this emphasizes Christ's preexistence and also his preeminence in that preexistence. He wasn't just something among other things, but he was over all things. He cre- he's the creator of all things, and they are for him then too. Yeah, over all things, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all were created through him and for him. That's to say, ultimately to serve him. And he is, verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. This passage here, these passages rather, are going to sort of serve as our bridge from talking about Christ as the image and then the image restored in us and what that looks like for Christians. So let's take a look at these verses then, guys. Well, if you want to keep it with the creedal kind of reflection here, you have creation in those first couple of verses you read. Here's a couple of verses that speak very clearly about redemption that seem to be like, what, our second article, right? Or at least part of our second article. Since he is the preeminent one, and in him all things are being created, I suppose you could go on to say then also all things are being recreated, which is kind of our point here. So that being the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, preeminent in everything, he reconciles all things to himself, making peace uh, and recreating and, and creating that new man within us. And making peace by the blood of his cross. 21, and you were once alienated... This is uh, you know, written to the church. You were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Isn't it entertaining how whenever the apostles bring up something about Jesus and something about his nature, it almost always happens within the context of exhortation? <laughs> Imagine that, right? Because he, he brings up this whole passage of the image of the invisible God and all of this so that he can say then to the Colossians that, you know, you were once alienated, but now you've been reconciled and you have become holy and blameless. So in other words, Jesus, the description of Jesus and his nature is the pretext to talking about our own righteousness and holiness, which is kind of the the whole reason why we're dwelling on this passage in the first place. Yeah, his work of reconciliation has as its goal to present us as holy here, the way that Paul describes it here. It's, it's in order that, in order to present you holy and blameless and above, above reproach before him. And like you said, there's always there's always this exhortation to continue in it. I'm thinking of Philippians 2 when you say that, Zelman, which is this high Christological passage about who in he was in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Well, that comes right after Paul says, have this same mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Yeah, get along, and this yeah, is why. Yeah. yeah, it's I mean it's it's very, very interesting this this exhortation to remain in the faith, that outside of that faith, there actually is no hope for salvation, that Christ has finished this work, but your faith must remain in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now that becomes, I mean, it seems kind of odd to say like, well, of course you should, you should remain in the faith, but those assumptions aren't so obvious today. I mean, you have all manner of different views of salvation and the atonement and that sort of thing. But as Lutherans, we actually don't believe in a once saved, always saved kind of thing. You know, I won't say perseverance of the saints, but more more in the case of, well, you believed here, you made your sinner's prayer, you did X, Y, Z, you know, fill in the blanks there. So you're good. And we hope to see you, you know, in church sometime when you're not too busy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Paul gives this great hope here. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. All of these wonderful truths about Christ and what he has done and what he is doing. And then there is that admonition. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from shifting from the hope of the gospel that you had heard. Now, shifting from the hope of the gospel can occur in more than you know one way. 
We tend to still think in terms of like the Reformation era. And so we hear another gospel and we think, well, one who would say that you're saved by your proper works. But it can mean anything. And certainly in this context, it can mean turning back to pagan gods or turning back to the old ways of doing things. You know, the Christian really needs to watch to make sure that he is on stable ground wherever he steps, because there is that danger there. Well, and we should also point out here, too, that as just as Christ's holiness and all of these things in his image have been given to us because of the, the blood of his cross, because of what he has done for us, Paul very much expects that we will actually be holy, that to be forgiven, and this is maybe what we run into a little bit more in our circles, being forgiven by Christ doesn't mean that, oh, okay, I'm saved by, by Jesus, and so now it doesn't matter you know, what it is that I do, but rather that Christ has recreated us to be holy in his sight, to actually do those good works, to, to quote Ephesians, which he has prepared for us from eternity to do. Right. So let's, let's start with what we confess here, and that the work of salvation in our justification is completed by Jesus Christ, and one for us by Jesus Christ. Now, there's the elephant in the room. How is that then apprehended by us, and in what sense is it complete? So let's let, let's talk about that. How how does one lay hold of the gospel promises? Yeah, this is the this is the role of faith, right? By faith we cling to these things, or by faith we receive these things. So if we can stick with the image language, Jesus perfects the image of God in human flesh. But that has to then be a gift that is given to us. That image has to be, uh, you can put it this way, traced on us. And it is traced on us in faith, right? That it doesn't, it's not mechanical. It's not something that can simply happen without our knowing it or being aware of it. But it is something that's received. It's his work in us by the spirit that is received by faith. Um, that faith, too, is a gift of God. So in the salvific work, all glory, laud, and honor go to God alone. So we want to get that right out in the open. We are not affirming any type of synergism when it comes to man's justification before God. We must start with the, the work of Jesus Christ and that accomplished. Then we must go to faith, how it's apprehended, and understand then that any good work and all good things then flow from faith and ultimately flow from that finished work of Jesus Christ. And I guess all I'm trying to get at, I mean, I, I absolutely affirm all of that. I'm not trying to give any sort of wrong impression. We just don't want to imagine that the new man isn't alive, if that makes sense. Right. Um, he right. is actually willing and active and doing things. And because he is alive in Christ by faith, which is a God-given gift, but he is engaged? <laughs> how, how would you put it? Right. Well, and having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, you look at something like, you know, like in Philippians, okay, you know, one five one six. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the last day. But you had the preceding verse, um, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So you do, you actually have both right there in that one passage, that we actually do actively participate in our faith and in our spiritual life, but it's ultimately God who is the one at work within you accomplishing it. Okay, not a robot. And the new man isn't weak. The new man isn't crippled. Okay, the new man struggles with that sinful nature, but the new man is valiant. I think that that's what we run into, and that's kind of what you're trying to say, right, Z? that we get this idea that the old Adam is just this big supervillain, right? It's doomsday, just pounding away on Superman, you know, for a 25-year-old comic book references for all you youth pastors out there. You can use that one. It's free. <laughs> and, uh, but, but that's the way, that's the way you look at it. You know, like the, like the old Adam is, is Ivan Drago and he, and he isn't okay. Satan's defeated. Sin is defeated. And it will ultimately perfectly be defeated within us in glory. But we've treated the um, the new man like it's almost as if we've taken the symbol and turned it into the cartoon of the devil or an angel, one on each shoulder. Sure. Yeah. And that's sure. not it at all. You know, we have to recognize that when God does a does something, it it's real, and that what God gives us is real, and it is powerful, and it is beautiful, and it is 
again, I don't know. I don't know any clearer way to say it than it's a reality that you are a new creation in Christ. And that doesn't, that doesn't only mean just a judicial declaration of righteousness, which it is, that is justification, a declaration of righteousness because Christ has paid that penalty. Getting all unselmic over here. Okay. What is the fruit of that then? Then what is it? Christ makes all things new. So what does that mean for us? That means that that old man that you were, that nature that you possessed, is dying. But the new man is living and will continue to live. So we're not schizophrenic either. You know, that's the other thing. We're one man, one man. And I would argue that the greater reality and the more important reality is the new man. We are the one new creation in Christ struggling with the vestiges of sin that we call the old Adam. And it is very much a struggle and it is a fight. Yeah, and the, to go along with what you just said there, Willie, the exhortations are always addressed to the new man. It's presumed that you, you know, you're not speaking to a schizophrenic person or the scriptures aren't when they address us this way to to grow up into our salvation, for instance, or to, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it a, a little more here, but to to progress in this renewal of the image, it actually addresses us to do these things and assumes that we will respond appropriately, right? We're not just going to take that and say, well, but I can't. Right, or I won't. I mean, we really have to go to, and we'll, you know, in these last couple minutes of the segment, you know, you look at Romans 7, and I think that's the best example of it, with Paul struggling with that. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He talks about doing things contrary to his will. And what he ascribes as his own is his new will, and his or his new man. He understands the war that's going on within it, but what does he, you know, what does he treat as his reality, the new creation? He actually describes here evil being this inner, this power at work against him within him. He's not saying like, yeah, it's like it's a foreign entity yeah, almost. There's not yeah. a part of me that's fighting this way and part of me that's fighting this way. There's actually this foreign body within my will. Right. Sin sin is a parasite that that he is struggling against. It's a tapeworm. <laughs> That'll preach. <laughs> but and but that's how we should look at it because if you look at it as as that, then maybe you'll come to hate it. I would hope that we would come to hate it because it's it sin it causes us to sin against almighty God and it causes us to harm our neighbor and our family. And ourselves, yeah. Because look at look at uh, Romans seven verse eleven. Um, this is a, a proof text right here. I'm proof texting. Go go for it. For <laughs> sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. In other words, sin, this foreign thing, this this hateful thing that he's trying to to root out of his being, but can't apart from God, is is actually what is working through the the good holy law and and deceiving him and actually killing him. And so, yeah, he wants to be free of this because it's, he's caught in it. It's not because he has two, how would you say, two wills? It's because he's, he's at war within, with this, this foreign body. Yeah. So you look at like verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, another law waging war against the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And then again, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So it is that struggle, and there is that contrast there. And, you know, without getting into debates of, is Paul talking about himself before he was regenerate or after? Let's just settle that debate. This is a regenerate Paul talking yeah. in Romans. And so. again, think of this okay. this uh, this distinction here, right? Paul, this is clearly a man who has the power to sin and the power not to sin at work within him. I think what, what you guys are bringing out helpfully is that what does he, is he like just caught in between these two powers struggling against each other? Or does he identify himself as having this power not to sin. And that's why it's such a, you know, it's such a pain to him when he does sin. He doesn't just throw his hands up and say, well, what could I do? You know, there's this power in me and I couldn't really suppress it. Like he's actually distraught over this and you can hear it in the words. Right. And and nevertheless, a great saint like Paul also sins and we sin every day and we struggle. We do not fulfill the law perfectly. We can't do it. 
okay, because we are struggling. We do still have that nature. So we don't want to forget that either. We don't want to become haughty here and presume that we can become perfect or that perfectionism, you know, is, is the way to go because it isn't. Day after day, everything is from the grace of God and by the grace of God. And we have to acknowledge that as well. Maybe just as a, a quick little note before we go to break, Paul's, I mean, one of Paul's real points is that we don't have two masters. We have one master, and that's Jesus Christ. And so when we fight with sin, when we're struggling with these things, yeah, we will struggle with it in this life, but it's only because we are in Christ that we are able to struggle at all. Or would even even would even want to lift a finger to struggle. Yeah. You know, I mean, apart from Jesus Christ, we're just going to, we're like uh, pigs wallowing in the mire. We wouldn't even think about these things apart from the regenerative work of, of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We're at break number two, guys. We'll be right back after this. We'll be back in just a few moments. A word fitly spoken proclaims Jesus Christ in all his fullness from in-depth exploration of Holy Scripture and study of how God's Word has borne fruit throughout church history. Come along with us at wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or on Twitter at wordfitly. This is a Word Fitly Spoken podcast. Willie Grills and Zelwyn Heidi here with David Appelt talking about the Christian man and uh, what he looks like, how he behaves, what he does, the realities within him. So guys, we're going to get right into it now. In our final section, we're actually going to talk about imperatives. And we might even use the word progressing. I don't know. I don't know. We might be triggering some people. So I'd like to start with this quote from the Solid Declaration. We all subscribe to this, right? Therefore, there is a great difference between baptized and unbaptized men. For since, according to the doctrine of St. Paul, all who have been baptized have put on Christ and thus are truly regenerate. They now have a liberated will. That is, as Christ says, they have been made free again. Whence, they are able not only to hear the word of God, but also to assent to it and accept it, although in great weakness. All right, let's dive right in, guys. We're going to talk about the new obedience here. This goes along with our last little section we were talking about receiving all of these things. So by faith, we receive the righteousness of Christ. By faith, uh, we receive his holiness. But that reception also then actually leads to something new, right? There's regeneration, and then that's followed with renewal. And that renewal actually grows, Right. And so the the liberation of the will or this new will that's created in a person, in a Christian, actually does something. Right. It doesn't just sit there idly, but it actually is engaged. It's active in doing good works. What does that look like then from a biblical perspective? It usually takes the form of uh, one of two things, an abstinence from something or just concrete examples of loving your neighbor. Usually, you know, orphans, widows, charity, that sort of thing. Paul, especially when talking about this, you know, what what is Paul coming up against, especially in a place like Corinth? What is he having to tell them to do? In Corinth, a lot of it is uh, shunning pagan practices. So sexual immorality is rampant, and so he has to speak about that at length, right? And in sometimes detail that you wouldn't think he'd have to he'd have to bring up. Like, shouldn't they get it? <laughs> right. And we sort of found ourselves back in that situation a little bit when it comes to ethics. I think so. And it's not, well, and not just sexual immorality, but also you get the whole issue with the lawsuit in First Corinthians. Yeah. Christians are not supposed to take other Christians to court. They're supposed to judge it among themselves or make peace among themselves. You've got them participating in pagan sacrifices. So again, that's you know, how you how you bring that into our context is a little bit difficult or it requires some explanation. But the point that we want to make here is just that Paul is very specific about it, right? He he is specific about the new ways that a Christian should walk and and the ways that they should avoid now or that they should shun. And it is in many ways in weakness because Paul, you know, is continually having to admonish them and remind them 
of the work done for them and what they ought to be doing or not doing. It's a perpetual problem that crops up within the church. Because again, we go back to that language of struggle and struggling with the old man. An old man, new man is maybe one way to get at this, Willie, that you put off the old man. So you're avoiding these old practices or the things associated with the flesh or however Paul's going to talk about it. And you put on the new man. Here we're back in this image of God realm. So Colossians 3.10 is a great example of this. Let me just read it here. I got to go back to nine. Do not lie to one another. So very, (laughs) very practical explanation here. Do not lie to one another. Why? Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self man here, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then he's going to go on to list a whole slew of things, some virtues to practice vices to avoid, but he gets very specific about it. And what I would kind of like to pick your brains about is how you can speak about this image of God, which has been restored to us. How do you grow up into the image of God? Because that's essentially what he's telling them to do. Put off the old Adam, put on the new Adam. And when you do that, you actually then have to do certain things, right? I mean, we've talked about restraining from certain things, you know, abstaining, like, you know, keeping ourselves back from vices. But there is also that positive sense, too, in which we are called to do things, this activeness, which we have as well. Paul, I think, gives a very helpful answer to your question, uh, David, when he says that we are being conformed to the image of God's son. Is that Romans 7? Is that right? Yeah, being conformed to the image of his son. You, Romans you have 8, that, yeah. Yeah, Romans 8, yeah, being conformed. But you have this language of confirmation or, or con- I'm not confirmation, conforming or growth or whatever you want to look at all throughout Scripture. I mean, you have it in Second Peter, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory. Ephesians, back to Paul, when he's talking about the church as the whole body for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You know, the church learning to treat each other as Christians ought to treat each other. There's an urgency to it. I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of Paul posting here. I realize that. But I mean, you look at like Romans 13, you know, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. First Thessalonians, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. I mean, language that, that really makes us bristle today. Learning to control your body is is an echo of that language of being conformed to the image of the sun. Well, maybe since you're since you're Paul posting, I'll just do a little Old Testament posting quick and point out that uh, Enoch and Noah walked with God. And so they are being in, in that sense, conformed also to, to Christ to do what is pleasing in his sight, even in opposition to everyone else of their own generation. Well, if if we can, if we go back to this image or language Christ, as the image of God, restores that image in us, and that is uh, certainly received by faith. And it's always, well, it's incomplete according to how we see it. It's complete in God's sight. And yet the exhortation and the imperative is for us to, like you guys mentioned, it's conformity uh, is the way the the scriptures speak of it. But maybe one way to picture this, uh, helpful way to picture it is that image needs to be clarified in us. I mean, is that, do you think that that's a different thing than conformity or is that essentially what conformity is describing? You know, if if we look at the word like sanctification, which is too often simply used to mean progression and holiness, if we, if we look at sanctification at, at its root, we're looking at set apart for something, right? So then you could, then that opens up the Bible even more. You can look at this language of being set apart or being consecrated, and you're always consecrated for a specific purpose, usually good works that God has given you. But I don't think I'm reading too much into it. I mean, because there's literally like Second Timothy, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Ephesians again, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so then sanctification language, set apart language brings us to consecration language. And then you look at, you look at all of this stuff from Jeremiah to Joel to Exodus, God setting apart these men or this people for himself for this specific task. 
and it, and it's all it's all right there. God expects us to be active, even in our weakness. God expects us to be active. And and of course, there's that wonderful passage in Leviticus too. I'm glad you brought up the Old Testament this time. There we really. go. <laughs> but uh, you shall be holy, as the Lord your God is holy. Yes, as, as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Yes. And yeah, so you have this you have this notion of. Yes, our holiness is complete because it is the work of God, because uh, Christ has reconciled us by the blood of his cross. But there is this sense in which, yeah, well, I suppose you could use the image of, I've often heard of like a plant, for example. A tree that is growing is not incomplete, you know, while it is growing. We don't, or we don't say that a child is somehow incomplete because, you know, he is fully human, um, but he's still grows he still matures and grows up into the man that uh he is is destined to be yeah and god is the one making this happen uh, in us all the way i mean jeremiah one right before i formed you in the womb i knew you and before you were born i set you apart i consecrated you i appointed you a prophet to the nations there is a sense then that for the christian or let's just say uh, really you know specifically the called out ones the ecclesia the ones the ones who are called out that they cannot but do these good works that God has given them because it is ultimately God who has willed to work them within them. That's, you know, back to Philippians. So it is going to happen. It's, it's, it's natural. Um, it's, it's a natural thing that comes from, that comes from faith. Right. And this, so that, that righteousness that we have received also then leads us to do righteous things. Right. Yeah. And, and everything, you know, and again, it uh, goes without saying, but everything, you know, begins within. You know, take care, brothers, lest there be any of you uh, that are evil or excuse me, with an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. You know, what does that evil inclination lead to? It leads to sin, sin, you know, or that desire itself is sinful, but it leads to the actual, you know, physical committing of sin. Well, then what does a new nature do, which is inclined towards the things of God? Does it merely stay internalized? No, it becomes actualized in love of neighbor in taking care of those around us, in guarding our own house, in guarding our own bodies. That's just the, that's the way it works. I think, Zelwyn, it, you, br- you brought up this point back when we were talking about Adam uh, in Eden, that the true, having the true knowledge of God always carries the connotation of like putting it into practice too, right? So think about maybe the distinction between wisdom and prudence. Like it's one thing to know the right thing to do to be wise is to know the right thing you ought to do, but the prudent person is the one who can actually do it in carry it out. Right. And so this, this knowledge, we have this knowledge of God, this true knowledge of God as is revealed in Christ. But that knowledge is not just in intellectual, Hey, look, look at all these things I know about him, but it also then we're not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Yeah, exactly. And this and faith and a living faith uh, actively desires to increase. So and it's not that we're just sitting passive saying like, you know, I, oh, it's so great that I know all these things. It's actually like, yeah, I want to progress. I want to be more conformed to Christ. I want to do what is pleasing in the sight of God because well, for God's sake. Well, let me uh, let me ask this uh, question here. Let's set up the old Puritan straw man and say, <laughs> but... Uh, then are you looking for your assurance when you're looking and trying to quantify your good works? Is it sinful to try to quantify them? David, you want to swing at that one? (laughs) Is it sinful to quantify good works? No, uh, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So work out your salvation in fear and trembling. I mean, well, I say quantify because we're we're often want to, uh, (laughs) to qualify them and go, well, you know, I volunteered down at the soup kitchen, but I am a sinner. Okay, yeah, we got yeah, it. We know. We I know. see what you mean. But quantify would be, well, I've been at the soup kitchen five days this week. I helped an old lady cross the street, and I've been working on my woodworking skills, which surely God loves a man who works with his hands. <laughs> Ergo, I am in the faith, and I'm doing pretty good. Now, again, I said we're erecting a straw man. I've never really met too many people who thought of it that way. But what do you do with that attitude? Because that's, you know, the the assumed danger here, that we're going to make everything introspective. Yeah, I think if you when you do encounter that or if you if you're prone to that yourself, it's good to to come back to like what we were talking about before with Romans seven. Paul does 
acknowledge that within him there is this double mindedness or there is the, there are these other desires you know there is this tapeworm at work and so even if you want to if you want to quantify all your good works well you you're also going to need to quantify the other ones too and if you actually line them up next to each other the accounting's not going to come out well in the end sure <laughs> and it's true and that's the thing you know good works are there they are evidence of faith and yet so our intent is this much that we want to serve the lord and obey him the good works themselves though are often spontaneous simply because they are that natural outgrowth of our new nature and the natural outgrowth of faith. So oftentimes a Christian does a good work and doesn't even realize it. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I'd say that's true. Although, you know, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, you know, is is it wrong for a Christian to, to enjoy doing good works? <laughs> Look at these. These are such Lutheran questions, right? Are good works <laughs> detrimental? Yeah, you know, it's a religion where we can enjoy every craft beer in the world, but... We can't enjoy helping out Aunt Ethel, you know, with yeah. her gout. So the Christian who enjoys doing good works, maybe this is, there's, it's not even a fine line because it's, it is a straw man that you're erecting there. Most people are not, when they think about, okay, what did I do today? You know, I really liked the fact that I did these certain things and you know, oh, those were good works. Well, look at that. The things that God wants us to do, I actually feel good about doing them. That doesn't mean that I'm slipping into some kind of self-righteousness and pride in my own doing. It's actually rejoicing in doing the things that God wants you to do. Right. And we can thank God for the opportunities that he gives us to serve him as well. And there is a, I mean, there is, of course, always a danger of making too much of good works. And, and, and I suppose you could say lapsing into a kind of self-righteousness. But we can also need to be careful of trying to be so self-conscious of like, oh, you know, I can't quantify anything that we actually use it as an excuse. Well, I mean, th you do have for the other end of the spectrum, you know, it's always the straw man. Or it's not even a straw man, because maybe there are people that are like this, and I'm sure they are. There are because there's a lot of people in the world who would boast in their own in their own righteousness and say, "Look at how holy I am and how good I am." Those people certainly do exist, and if you flip through enough religious television, you might find it. But what of the man who glories in his wickedness? And I mean, the Christian who glories in his wickedness or in his past this this sort of temptation to to have a better testimony borrow an evangelical word, to have a better testimony than the guy who just spoke or the guy standing in front of me. Yeah, the and out of out of sinful pride we actually magnify our sin so that it looks worse, if that makes any sense. Right. In best construction, maybe they're just trying to borrow from the apostle, you know, chief of sinners and that sort of thing. Um but no, there really is that there is a culture of that out there. Paul glories in his weakness but he doesn't glory in his like former life. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, because we believe that when sin is forgiven, when sin is absolved, it is gone. And yet there is a temptation to go back to those sins and to keep revisiting those sins, not committing them, mind you, but bringing them up, dredging them up, using the stories of those sins or the, the lesson from those sins or something like that. That's not always the healthiest attitude. I mean, if you're an alcoholic and, you know, you commit a vehicular homicide, yeah, maybe you, you should probably remember to lay off the sauce. Probably. At the same time, you know, you don't, you don't, <laughs> yeah, you don't make that your identity. You know, you don't make yeah. that your identity or your brand. And again, you know, that's, but that's, that's the image. That's the, the counterculture kind of image that people, that certain people would want, would want for themselves. And, you know, it sells. And why does it sell? Because people are hurting. And people do feel broken. And so they are sort of attracted like a moth to the flame to a lot of that language. And it is, uh, like you said, that is a, uh, what's the right way to say it? That's a stage, I guess, that everyone kind of passes or everyone enters into and, and should, you know, having remorse over sin, that's good. But uh, godly grief is not just, I feel bad about it and I kind of dwell on well, aren't I such a bad person? Well, godly grief leads to repentance, and repentance doesn't revel in that. And God certainly, you know, uses our sin to teach us things and to teach us really what we shouldn't be doing and, and allows us to suffer the consequences of that fairly often. 
you know, and of course allows us to get away with the consequences often too. But that doesn't mean that we're Lot's wife and we turn back and gaze at Sodom. Not that that's what she was doing, but this sort of remembering thing. But we don't turn our back and look at that the old way with some kind of longing or, or use it in some sort of crass way. We keep our eyes ever forward, always focused upon the cross, always focused upon Jesus Christ, always hearing and receiving the word of God and doing what it would have us to do and hearing that message of salvation accomplished and won for us. Yeah, put off the old man and put on the put on the new man more and more. Grow up into these things more and more. Well, that means that implies paying attention to the new man and what he says, what he does, and following following in his footsteps. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. This has been a word fitly spoken. Zelman, David, thank you. A pleasure as always. If you like what absolutely guys, <laughs> if you like what you hear, check us out wordfitlyspoken.org, facebook.com slash wordfitly, or on Twitter, whatever that is, at wordfitly. I'm Willie Grills. God love you and God bless. <laughs>